Good morning and thank you for joining this webinar from Wiltshire Council about the potential road route options that could serve a new development to the south and east of Chippenham, which we are calling the Future Chippenham Project. My name is Richard Walters and I'm the head of Wiltshire Council's major projects and enabling service and I will be chairing the webinar this morning. I hope that you'll forgive the rather impersonal nature of this form of consultation event, which of course is imposed upon us by the pandemic. We are keen to reach as many people as possible with our consultations, even in these difficult times. And so we hope the webinars will enable you to access further information on this very important project for Chippenham. If you wish to see closed captions of speakers' words, then please click on the CC button on the bottom right of the screen, and they should appear after 30 seconds or so. If you're having any technical problems, please close Teams or your browser, reopen it and click on the meeting link again. Other problems may be down to your home internet connection. If you're hearing an echo, it may be that you have this event open in two or more windows. This is the third of three webinars on the road consultation and follows a slightly different format from the previous two. For this webinar, we are focusing on questions and answers. During the consultation, we have received a significant amount of questions on a number of recurring themes. In response to this, we've structured today's webinar around four specific themes. These are the distributor road, transport modelling, environmental considerations, master planning and next steps. We've assigned nine minutes to each theme to allow for a short overview of the frequently asked questions already received on the theme from the relevant panel members and some time for further questions and answers. I would encourage you to put your answers in the Q&A section, highlighting which theme you would like to raise a question on, which you can do now and at any time during the webinar. We've also allowed time at the end of the theme slots for questions and answers on more general issues to be put to the panel. Our panel today are Simon Hendy, Steve Wilson and David Milton from Wiltshire Council and Jamie Adkins and Thomas Tremlett from Atkins Global. Simon is Wiltshire Council's Director of Housing and Commercial Development. Steve is the future Chippenham Programme Workstream Lead for Road Delivery and David is the future Chippenham Programme Workstream Lead for Master Planning. Jamie is a senior engineer and Thomas a senior environmental consultant at Atkins Global, who've been appointed as consultants to the council advising on the future Chippenham programme. Thank you to those who have already submitted questions in advance. For those who would like to raise questions during the webinar, you can do this using the Q&A panel that should be located to one side of your screen. For some of you, the Q&A panel may be beneath the slides and you'll need to scroll down to see it. If you cannot see the Q&A panel, you may need to click on the icon of two overlapping speech bubbles to open this panel. If possible, we may try and answer some of your questions in writing through the Q&A panel, so do please keep an eye on this. All questions submitted are recorded and written responses will be provided after this session, along with a copy of the presentation slides. These will be emailed out to all those who've registered to attend this webinar. A video recording of the webinar will also be made available on the Council's YouTube channel. Lastly, we would encourage you to actively take part in this consultation and to give us your feedback in writing on the road route options. If you can, please help us spread the word about this consultation and encourage others you know who may be interested to give us their feedback too. The Future Chippenham team and Council's customer services are happy to provide hard copies of the consultation materials to those people who may not have digital access. A link to the consultation website, along with the email address and telephone number to contact the Council's customer services team is shown on this slide. Paper copies can also be collected from the reception desk at the Council's Monkton Park office. The consultation is currently live and runs until 5pm on Friday the 12th of March. So that's it from me for now, um, and I'm going to hand over to Simon Hendy for the first part of the presentation. Thanks, Richard. I just want to take a moment just to draw out the distinction of, a, of two consultations that are taking place at the moment and also set the context for this consultation. So Wiltshire Council's local planning authority is currently consulting its local plan. The Wiltshire local plan review process considers the level of growth in the town through to 2036, including where new homes could be allocated. And that's entirely separate consultation from this, the future chip and road route options consultation. 
Any new distributor road would be subject to the outcome of future planning application and progress to the local plan review. More information about a separate local plan review process can be found on the website link shown on this slide. Now, we understand that some people may not want to see development of the proposed scale or development of, of, of a road, and we respect their views and welcome their, those responses as part of this consultation. But it's important they take the opportunity to express their views in the local plan consultation, as that's the process that determines if development comes forward, and thus if there is a need for infrastructure such as a distributor road. Future Chippenham Programme responds to that decision by consulting on the detail and ensuring proposals are viable. So this next slide is an infographic showing the, uh, the sort of journey that's brought us to the position we're in today. The possibility of future development of Chippenham was identified in 2017 via the Chippenham Site Allocations Plan. An examination of that plan identified that an eastern and southern link road could improve the town's network resilience and that could also support growth of the town in future plan periods. Therefore, the Council took the advantage of government housing infrastructure infrastructure fund to bid for funding so that if development came forward in the future and the council was successful in being awarded that funding in December 2019. Recently the council has entered into contract with Homes Inc to secure that funding. As can be seen the local plan consultation has begun and we are now consulting on the detail of possible road routes if that is required as an outcome of the local plan review. So if the local plan review allocates development that requires road infrastructure, Future Chippenham has secured the funding to ensure that development is infrastructure led and thus enabling better master planning to take place. Thus, the consultation is taking place on possible road route options linking the A350 at the northern and southern ends of Chippenham and then a master plan so that if the local plan review supports development, the government funding can be used towards that. As part of the funding agreement with government, it was necessary to indicate the sort of development that could be supported subject to the local plan review. And over the two plan periods, in broad headline terms, that could be up to 7,500 homes and 1 million square feet of employment space. That's great. Um, thank you very much for that, Simon. Um, we're now going to turn to the first round of questions, and the first theme is the distributor road. So I'm going to ask Jamie from Atkins to uh, do a, a brief overview of the uh, questions and issues that have come in. Thank you, Jamie. Jamie, I can't hear you. You're on mute. I do apologise. Right, I'll start again on this. Uh, so the plan on the screen uh, shows the distributor road options and link road options for the scheme. So the outer route is the purple one on the plan, which is option A. The middle route is the green line on the plan, which is option B. And the orange line is the inner route, and that is option C. So those are the distributor road options. And there are two link road options to Pusham Way. Option one connecting at Canal Roundabout and option three that connects east to Forest Lane. So common questions that have, that have come in as part of the consultation so far. Uh, what is the purpose of the, of the distributor road and its high level design? So the road's primary function is for local transport connectivity and distribution. And this is to enable residential and employment development. And it is not a strategic road or a bypass. The road is a single carriageway and includes transport infrastructure for cyclists, pedestrians, buses and cars. And the road can be described as a primary street running through the future development. So another common question, question that's come in is what is the speed of the road? So the, the road will be low speed. It's likely at this stage to be 30 miles an hour through the development, but this will be subject to agreement with Wiltshire Council Highways for planning, and it will also be subject to a road traffic order as part of a separate decision making process. So does housing front onto the road? So it's intended that houses will front onto the road corridor with pedestrian access directly from the primary street. And at this stage, we're considering that motor vehicles will access 
to rear parking courtyards, although there may be some limited direct access onto the road for, for shops and retail. And the other common question that's come in is what structures are included in the scheme? So there are two large structures over the River Avon flood zones. Uh, to, the, to the north of the scheme, the, the bridge over the River Avon is, is 258 metres long and that's common to all distributor road options. And to, to the south of Chippenham, the, the lengths of, of bridge viaduct vary depending on the length, on, depending on the distributor road options. So option A has a 468 metre long viaduct. Option B has a 444 metre long viaduct and option C, which is the inner route, has a 336 metre long viaduct. So in addition to those structures, there are bridges over the Wilkes and Barts Canal. Uh, they're much shorter, they're 30 metres in length. And they option A has two, two bridges, one at Pewsham Locks, which is which is close to the, to the restoration there. So it would need to be care, very carefully designed. Uh, and it has another bridge just north of the A4 at Green Lane Farm. And the inner, the inner and middle routes have the same bridge location near, near Pewsham Way and close to the, the Pewsham Locks restoration and could potentially provide access to, to future development at that location. And the final bridge is dependent on the Pewsham Link option uh, that we take forward. Uh, Pewsham Link option one has a, has a bridge that is currently 80 metres long, bridging the, the valley at, at Avon Valley Walk to connect Canal Roundabout. Uh, the other Pewsham Link Road option does, doesn't require a bridge. Great, thank you, Jamie, for that um, quick overview. Um, we've had quite a few questions that have come in on this, and I'm going to bring um, Steve Wilson in uh, as well to answer, uh, I think, a number of these. The first question that I've got um, uh, is, are you intending to build the whole road at the same time? Wouldn't it be better to build it in stages as the houses are built over a period of years? I wonder, Steve, whether you might be able to help shed some light on that. Uh, yes, thank you, Richard. Good morning, everybody. Um, in terms of the scheme itself, uh, current thinking is at the moment that we will be delivering this as a single project, as a single entity. And um, that obviously allows for certain efficiencies of scale. Um, there may be elements of the road that would open slightly in advance of other elements of the road, but certainly it won't be uh, more than maybe a few months apart. So I think it can be clearly considered as one project and one single entity. Um, and in terms of uh, the progressive building, really the, the program for delivery, it, it's largely been driven by the availability of funding coming through the Housing Infrastructure Fund. Um, so that's really driving our program on this. OK, great. Thank you for that, Steve. Um, the next question I've got is um, around what's going to happen. So the question is what, what will happen at the points where the public rights of way intersects with the distributor road. I think I'll bring you in Steve on this initially and then perhaps Jamie might want some comments as well. Yeah, um, clearly there's several sort of public rights of way that will be intersecting with the, the route. Um, accessibility is a key issue for the design and we want to develop that permeability and that connectivity. Um, our current thoughts are that we will be trying and aiming for at grade crossings uh, to, to allow people to, to, to pass across the new route as, as easily as possible. Mm. We're not really anticipating subways or footbridges at this stage. Jamie? Okay. Yes, yeah, so I think I can add to that. So that is, that is a, a reasonable assumption at this stage, Steve. Uh, but the, the final types of crossings really will be informed by the transport assessment for the scheme. At planning stage and, and of course these will be reviewed by a by an independent road safety audit. Okay that's really good thank you for that. Um, we've, we've obviously you know, touched on it in in the presentation um, in terms of what the road will look like and, and you know and sort of in the, an evolution of the, of the of the previous question but as we've had quite a few questions uh, around that um, and there are people looking to understand you know, okay what what examples might there be of you know similar roads that we can see elsewhere that give us some sense of what this might look look like w would you be able to give us some indication Jamie on that yes Richard so there there are uh, we've presented a, a number of cross sections in in previous webinars uh, there's actually one on the screen, which is a, a mm. possible cross section yeah. on the on the on the on the background there. Mm. Uh, 
so those, those are available on, on previous webinars. Uh, I suppose that the, one of the better examples uh, that you could actually visit uh, isn't actually in Wiltshire, but there is a, a location at Lobley's Drive uh, in Brockworth in Gloucester, which is the section that is east of the M5, and that's quite similar. Uh, and there are parts of Upton Meadows in Northampton that, that are also similar. But I think Lobley's Drive is probably the, the closest example. Um, yeah. Obviously, it will evolve as part of part of the master planning process. Yeah, I, I, I would tend to agree with that, uh, uh, Richard. I think that clearly the, the, the cross section that's that's on the screen in front of us at the moment gives a good sort of indication as to the elements of the of the carriageway and, and the surrounding infrastructure. Um, within Wiltshire, I, I think perhaps the the one road that that I could allude to would be would be Eastern Way in Melksham. Mm -hmm. um, the the road size there, the scale of the infrastructure there is is in line with with, with what we're envisaging the separated footways and and, and cycleways. Uh, Eastern Way in Melksham though doesn't have the the tree lining, the landscape planting, and it obviously doesn't have the the, the buildings fronting onto it. So if 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 people were were looking for a local example, they they, they could go to Eastern Way and perhaps use a little bit of imagination to to to, to include for that the tree lining and the uh, uh, and the building frontage. Yeah. Okay, that's great. Thank you both for that. Um, I think we've got time for just one last last question on this before we move on to the next the next theme. Um, and it's around um, the the stake the stakeholders' influence, and, and the question is, what influence do individual stakeholders have on the route selected? I.e., is there more weight um, from one to another? I'll put put that one perhaps to you, Steve, if you could answer, give a response yeah, to that. Yeah. Okay. Um, I suppose the first thing I would say is that clearly we're interested to hear the views of everybody, um, and we will take all views into account. Um, if, if you think about sort of engineering design, there's, there's, there's particular disciplines that we, we need to think about and certain stakeholders have particular influence in those particular disciplines. Um, I, I suppose the Environment Agency might be an example. Their discipline clearly is the rivers, the floodplains and how we deal with, with, with the question of water and drainage on this scheme. So their views in that discipline area will be key. Um, but clearly, the, the views of the public, the views of the locals and local knowledge is 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 of, of importance to us, and and we're all ears. We want to hear those local views. That's great. Thanks very much for that, um, Steve and Jamie. I think we're going to move on now, if we can, to the um, round two um, questions, and that's tra transport modelling. And I think Jamie, you're going to give us a brief overview of the kind of questions that have come in around this before we we launch into the 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 Q&A itself if that's okay yep yeah, okay that's fine uh, if we could just move on one slide please so there's a, a three common questions that have come in uh, the first one is what is the evidence base used for the scheme uh, so the Wiltshire strategic traffic model has been used and includes future forecast years for 2024 which would, would could be an opening year 2036 which is the the local plan year and 2051 for future forecast year so the base count data that, that was available and this this also informed the HIF bid uh, was was taken at, in during 2018 which was obviously pre-COVID-19 which is another question that's come up. Uh, so the influence of COVID-19 will certainly be considered and it'll be considered as part of the, the transport assessment for the planning application. Uh, at the moment, it's very a very difficult thing to predict, but it will be something that, that will be included in, in the process. So the, the modelling for the options assessment uh, builds on previous evidence from the Chippenham site allocations plan, which was for the previous local plan up to 2026. Uh, and also builds on evidence that was that was undertaken as part of the HIF application. So the, these two these two documents support the selection of the Eastern Distributor Road as the most appropriate option to enable the housing growth. So the options assessment report for the road, uh, the modelling focuses on comparing the traffic impacts of each route option. So in terms of current findings, Actually, the results are, are quite similar for e each option. Uh, there's, there's minimal difference in, in traffic modelling terms, although option C, which is the inner route, does, does perform 
better than the other two in terms of reducing traffic in the town and reducing pressure on, on existing junctions. Mm. So what is the process and how is this linked to designing a new road? So transport modelling and the associated forecast flows inform the route types and whips for all modes of transport, and that's including cycles, pedestrians and motor vehicles. It also informs the new road junction types and scale. And it will also inform uh, amendments to existing roads and junctions and requirements to mitigate the impact of future housing and employment developments. So all of all of the transport modelling is, is summarised in a, in a transport assessment for the planning application. So that is pending, but it, yeah. that, is, that is what we will be doing. Brilliant. OK, um, we've got again quite a few questions to get through and not much time in which to do it. And I, I'm going to pose the first one to you, Jamie, um, which is um, does your traffic modelling allow for the expansion of other areas of Chippen or just the development that you want to promote? So the, the traffic modelling un undertaken to date reviews the housing development to the east of Chippenham, and this was predominantly undertaken as part of the HIF bid. Uh, future Chippenham will seek to promote development on Wiltshire land to the east of Chippenham, uh, and all landowners and developers will, of course, be responding to the local plan review process. And where their land is allocated, this will provide a good, good basis for progression of, of, their, of the relevant planning applications. So what I would say is it is logical that improvements to the transport network will provide greater opportunities for, for other areas to be developed. Uh, and indeed, there are a variety of landowners located along the, the Eastern Distributor Road route and potentially other areas in the town that, that may also benefit. OK, thanks. Richard, could I just come in yeah, there of course, just of course. to add something uh, in addition to what Jamie's just been saying there? The, the question seems to allude to the, the, are we just modelling just for future Chippenham or in considering future Chippenham, are we considering other potential developments that come forward? Clearly, the, 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 the traffic model and the transport modelling that we do does include for uh, other developments that are sort of uh, in the pipeline, if you like, if they are committed developments. So we're not just yeah. looking at the existing situation and then future yeah. Chippenham. We are looking at it more globally. OK, um, thank you for that, Steve. Uh, so we've got quite a few questions around the extent of traffic um, modelling. Um, I'll ask one more, um, which is um, a quite a specific one. Um, what is the model coverage and which roads are included? For example, is the modelling including the A4 to Khan, A342 Derry Hill and the various country lanes in the area? Is, is that one yeah. for me? I think that's one for you, Jamie, if you wouldn't mind. <laughs> OK, I was going to uh, give you the easy ones. Yeah, uh, so the, the the model used is the strategic model for Wiltshire. It's, so it's an area wide model, so it has all of these roads within it. Uh, but what we uh, as part of the part of the HIF bid initially, uh, which also feeds into the options assessment report, uh, we've we've cordoned uh, an area to, to focus on on town centre congestion. So a lot of the output data that you'll see in the summary and the options assessment report does focus on 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 unlocking that congestion in the town centre as, as an enabler for, for housing growth. Uh, so the model will will assess the impact on the wider transport network. Uh, and this will be part of the, the transport assessment at, at planning application stage. So it, it will all be reviewed. But at the moment we have we've, we've, I think correctly we've focused on mm. town centre congestion because that's where a lot of the issues are. Uh, and that was flagged in the in the also flagged in the CSAP uh, with the Chippenham site allocations plan. Uh, so I think there was a second point to this question actually. Uh, so uh, yeah, and and um, yeah, I, I think there's a, the, the, we need to understand about the 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 uh, the results uh, and what we're anticipating in terms of traffic increases. Okay, so. There are a, a number of assessment categories that are, that are included in the, in the options assessment report. So uh, there is extra information in, in section 10.8 of that particular report. It's quite a big report, but if you go to that section, that's that's where you'll find the summary. Mm. Uh, but what it what they do show is that compared to a no road scenario, uh, there is a significant reduction in 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 overcapacity queues and delay. 
so it does it does prove in there that, that it's, the road is is required to unlock future development okay thank you for that um whilst certainly not on modeling a question's come in around the um public rights of way um which i think i'm going to put to Steve, um, will the intersecting public rights of way, such as the national cycle route, um, be resurfaced as part of the scheme? Um, OK, uh, I don't think we're anticipating sort of wholesale changes to the existing public rights of way infrastructure. Uh, obviously, there's there's various routes coming into the area, passing through the area. I, I don't think we're, we're, we're sort of going to throw the, the blanket particularly wide in terms of resurfacing everything and, and upgrading everything. Mm. Um, but the needs of walking and cycling is obviously a key part and an integral part of the of the design. So as we get into that detailed design, Richard, we will be sort of looking for opportunities. It may yeah. be that there'll be local resurfacing take place, perhaps vegetation clearance, maybe some street light lighting upgrades, but I would imagine it's going to be relatively local to the new routes uh, and, and, and relatively small, not, not certainly not wholesale resurfacing of national cycle routes, no. No, OK, thanks for that. I think we've got time for one more transport related question before we move on to the environmental uh, section. Um, and that one, I think, is again for you, Steve, and it goes back to a question that was, that was asked earlier around the you know the phasing of the road uh, delivery um, and there's questions will the whole road open at the same time and if not could the existing road network end up as rat runs um yeah i think i, I possibly sort of half covered this off earlier mm. richard uh, I, the, the intent is that this is going to be a, a a single road and broadly speaking it will all open sort of within a short phase or short period of time um I suppose that there could be some sort of uh, local routing that develops as, as elements come forward. Um, what, one consideration that we will need to, to, to have as we go into the construction phase, which obviously is, is, is some time into the future as yet, um, will be construction traffic and how we deal with that, how we route that, how we access the site. That's all a question which, which will need to be considered yeah. uh, as we develop the transport assessment for this process. But that's that's certainly we're aware that 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 will be a, a concern um, as on most schemes. How how do we actually build it? How do we access the site is something that we need to uh, to consider carefully. Great. OK, thanks for that, Steve. As I say, as with the last section, we've got other questions that we could pose to you, but we need to move on now to the environmental section round three. Um, and Tom, I think, is going to take us through some of the more common questions and you'll be understand that we'll have had a lot of questions around um, environmental uh, issues relating to the uh, the road options, the road proposals. So, Tom, if you wouldn't mind um, giving a quick overview of the the main questions that we've asked and then we can get into uh, the specifics. Yep, thanks Richard. Um, so yeah, so for environment, um, we've picked up the following key, th key three themes um, from the questions so far really. Um, the first one being obviously what's potential impact of the scheme on biodiversity is. Um, so the biodiversity assessment for the options appraisal process has been informed by a phase one habitat survey undertaken on site. Um, which basically identifies what types of habitat are on site, what protected species are likely to be on site. Um, and then that's been combined with a review of the environment record. So that gives us details of what previous species have been found on site and where they've been located. Um, so the phase one habitat survey found that generally speaking, the biodiversity, the majority of the site is actually relatively poor. Um, because its land type is semi-improved grassland, narrowable land, which does not encourage high biodiversity. Um, and this has been supported by the findings of the species specific surveys we've undertaken to date. Um, we do have some pockets of better habitat across the site, um, sort of located around sort of the River Avon, the River Marden, um, and also along sort of along the minor water courses like Ockhamwood Brook, um, and also a sort of yeah, small patches of woodland um, and some ponds. Um, the hedgerows on the site are also relatively species poor um, and lacking sort of woody vegetation, um, but at the same time they are an important asset for protected species we do have on site to commute around the site and get to these sort of better better areas of better habitat um, and obviously they're also used for foraging and occasional sheltering um, so the main impact from the scheme on biodiversity is likely to come from um, the cutting across these hedgerows um, cutting, cutting across these hedgerows obviously which is clearly required and um, mm. bearing, bearing mind the landscape we are 
we are moving through. Um, however, these effects should be mitigatable through careful design of vegetation planting as the scheme progresses um, and other solutions. So, you know, in that sense, we can strengthen existing hedgerows um, and um, other solutions for connectivity, such as wildlife tunnels or green bridges to cross um, the, the, the roads um, as required. Um, more detailed assessment based off surveys undertaken for species, for specific species, sorry, um, will be undertaken to inform the design and the environmental impact assessment for planning application. Um, so essentially more, more information will come forward in respect of that environmental mitigation for that. Um, in respect of landscape, um, so in the first two webinars, um, I sort of largely focused on um, option A um, in the sense of there was potential significant effects identified for views from south and east um, of, the, of, of that option, which weren't felt under options B and C um, because there weren't any significant impacts on landscape associated with those options. But obviously there is a, a lot of interest from people, particularly from Moncton Park and Pusham, just wanting to know what the visual effect of the scheme is there. So um, going into that, um, both Pusham and Moncton Park um, both have quite dense sort of vegetation strips around the outside of the development sort of towards our site, um, which does give us a natural screen um, to work in to a degree. Um, you'll also find um, that the existing topography options B and C sort of run behind existing landform um, that allow it to be naturally screened. Um, and when there would be an occasional bit where you would, would potentially be in views, um, it's within the landscape character where uh, landscape character where sort of vegetation screening and um, small uh, landscape buns may will be appropriate to help screen the road. Um, so these effects were seen as sort of non-significant. Um, I think one which actually isn't on there as far as a um, a sort of a key thing brought up as far as obviously clearly carbon. Um, we've had a lot of comments sort of asking about what yeah. the quantified carbon cost of the proposals are um, at this stage. Um, the project hasn't quantified the carbon cost of the scheme with the assessment based off a comparative assessment between the options um, based off experience of you know, previous schemes um, and looking at the usual key indicators for this, such as scheme length and the requirement for structures. Um, the reason this approach was taken forward for the options appraisal is that we're just at such an early design stage that there is not enough robust quantifiable data for us to assess um, when a preferred option to, you know, to, to assess and get like a, a reasonable estimate, um, reasonable accurate estimate. So when a preferred option has been selected, um, the scheme design will progress to allow planning application to be made. And as part of this pr design process, opportunities for carbon reduction will be explored and there'll be a quantified assessment of construction carbon provided as part of the environmental impact assessment of the scheme, which will be submitted alongside the planning application. Yeah. Thanks very much, Tom covered a lot of ground there but there's still I think a lot more ground to cover yes, in terms of the questions that have, have come in so I'm and, and I think I'm going to direct most of these um, at you so buckle up um, first question is um, won't we increase the flooding won't this development increase the flooding downstream yeah so um, the development of the road scheme and housing development will not cause additional flooding of, of homes or property either within an existing settlement or within the new development um, as sort of visible on the cross section you're seeing on the screen now um, sort of you can see like the the beginning of sort of the the, the sustainable urban drainage system that will be incorporated by the scheme um, this will ensure that all additional water runoff from the increase in hard standing in the area um, as a result of the high will be collected using swales and then discharged into settlement ponds. These ponds will then be allowed to fill up during periods of heavy rainfall and discharge into local watercourses at rates agreed with the local e flood authority and the environment agency. And these discharge rates will ensure that the schemes will not lead to a faster discharge of water into local rivers, um, which causes sort of river storm flow where you get just the huge, uh, the huge river peaks. Um, so yeah, that's the the key the key part there really. I mean, the road or the housing development will also not you know not be built within the existing floodplain, um, so you won't have that effect either. Okay, thanks for that, Tom. Um, next one is I mean, there's been questions about habit, many questions about habitats, um, but it's a kind of portmanteau question, as it were. Um, how will the natural habitats be managed during the construction phase? Okay, um, so. As I sort of made slight allusion to in my sort of quick overview, um, we are sort of still doing specific species surveys in the site and they'll tell us exactly what what species we have on site and what their sort of populations are like. Um, this information will be used to assess the impact of the scheme upon the species and that will drive the necessary mitigation to uh, protect these species and natural habitats during construction. So depending on the findings of the surveys, 
um, protected species license may be required. Um, so, yeah, th these licenses will will tell us what um, what mitigation is required to protect that species, whether whether trapping and translocation is required, um, whether we can you know, undertake the works using precautionary methods of working, um, and this all information is generally then stored in something like a construction environmental management plan alongside other measures yeah. which will protect the no lateral habitat such as you know, preventing dust and that will all sort of generally gets controlled in the construction environmental management plan of which a copy is likely to be submitted alongside the planning application which will then be built up yeah. further um, as we progress towards building the road. Okay thanks Tom. Um, we talked about habitats there but where a specific um, uh, creatures in the in the vicinity as it were. Um, we, we have otters um, in the river. Um, what's going to happen to them and their habitat? Yeah, um, so, so I mean yeah, so we are actually doing we are doing otter survey. we did otter surveys um, last sort of last October. Um, so um, as a key impact in that respect um, the design of the bridges over the River Avon um, will be clear span um, of the bank and the river channel. So Otter commuting um, will be able to continue um, when the schemes, you know, when the schemes up and running, um, without any real problems there. Um, and obviously, we will look to provide additional mitigation to sort of encourage that habitat um, as the scheme comes forward. Okay, thanks, Tom. Um, several questions around carbon. I mean, you've picked it up in your in your presentation. I'll just pick pick one. Um, how are you going to manage the carbon footprint of this development? Okay. Yeah. So, um, so the carbon footprint in design is generally sort of worked up using sort of three key, um, three key themes. There's avoidance mitigation, um, reduce um, carbon, and then sort of remediation slash compensation. Um, so, an example of an avoidance measure on this scheme um, would be something simple as choosing a shorter route. You know, um, if you choose a shorter route, um, which avoids needing to cut more material, get more materials transport to site. Obviously, there's huge savings in that regard. Mm. Um, mm. A reduction mitigation um, would be the use of something like you know, lower carbon materials for the job. So we've got bridges that are required. You would maybe look at using low concrete alternatives and looking at a full life cycle approach for that material and obviously what how much maintenance it needs. Um, so you would look at that and a sort of a reduction measure. And then in respect of remediation compensation, an easy example of this is is you know, vegetation planting. You know, you're essentially trying to offset the development to a degree. Um, but yes, yeah, so things like vegetation planting as well as um, as well as you know, looking at it in a whole life cycle again, you would say we're well, using trees which don't need such careful management as maybe grass that might need routine maintenance. And obviously, there's a carbon cost of of running strimmers and uh, and and yeah, and cutting that grass. Yeah. Okay. Um, there are a lot of other questions, Tom, but I'm afraid we've yes. we've we've probably run out of time in this section. But if we come, if we've, it's possible we might come back to one or two at the end of the of the, of the webinar. But I ne now need to move on to um, round four uh, of this, which is the master planning and next steps. And I'm going to ask my colleague Dave Milton to give us an overview of the uh, position and kind of questions that have come in ar around this. Uh, so over to you, Dave, if that would be OK. Yes, thank you, Richard, and uh, good morning, everybody. Um, so I must reiterate um, the question um, of if this development should proceed, if we should build on the east of Chippenham, is a question for the local plan, the policy document for Wiltshire. And uh, that's active consultation at the moment. We really urge you, please engage with that process. It's an important one. So this process, or the process of master planning, will be about asking, if it does go ahead, what form should that development take? You know, how can the area be best developed to uh, produce the best place and the best benefits for the community? In very simple terms, um, a master plan descri it describes and also maps out an overall development concept for a, an area or site. It will include all future land uses, it will include the urban design, what the place will look and feel like, the landscaping, the built form, the essential infrastructure and the services to um, pro uh, needed to uh, provide services to the uh, future residents. Master planning is based on a, a really in-depth understanding of a place. It provides a clear and consistent framework for the development of, of a particular site. It is important that a large site particularly is master planned. I mean, that is to ensure that the development on the ground provides the most sustainable and effective development for that particular place. Master planning should be produced objectively based on firm evidence, such as the constraints that uh, operate on the site 
and the on-ground uh, assessments such as ecology, water, landscape, topology, etc. These things all together dictate the layout and capacity of the site. It is likely that a master plan for the site could meet Shippenham's housing needs uh, and employment needs well into the future and provide some um, good certainty about how the, the uh, town will develop well into the future, probably beyond the local plan period currently being reviewed. A master plan showing the distribution of land uses, the connectivity, the design concepts and essential infrastructure will uh, be drafted this spring uh, by the future Chippenham team. There will then be full public consultation on that master plan and that's currently planned for the summer of 2021. And um, all representations that we receive will then be responded to and published in a written report, which will be, set, um, which will be published on the internet and to our public information points. And all comments, we will show how they've influenced the revisions to the master plan. It will be a meaningful consultation process. Thank you, Richard. <clears throat> Thanks very much, Dave. That's a helpful overview of the master plan position. Uh, a few questions um, that I can put to you. Um, one of which relates to, you know, how the future Chippenham master plan relates to the um, the rest of, you know, the, the town and, and, and how does the rest of the town in particular um, the town centre benefit from this development? Yes. Thank would you. you. Have, would you have a view on that, Dave? Yes, I would. Yeah, thank you. Um, basically, um, we would be looking at trying to ensure that any new development is is planned in such a way that it is um, part of the settlement. It doesn't form a, a, an isolated suburb. It's part of the settlement, and that can help. You know, the your growth in population can help existing businesses and services be viable and vibrant. So it's about ensuring there's con connectivity, that there's good design, there's good integration with that community, and actually we form, you know, a, a vibrant Chippenham. And we have we we manage the threshold of retail, for example, so we bolster the existing town centre and, and and don't compete with it. So it's about a good joined up planning in that respect, Richard. Thank you. Okay, that's great. We've had several questions about. Um, about the local plan and the relationship with the with the master plan. I think you've probably um, captured those, so I, I won't uh, pose those to you um, again. Um, there's a question here that the interesting question about some um, will there be allocation of space for self builds? What's your thoughts on that? As part yes. of the master planning. Yeah, I think it's a great suggestion. I think we should be encouraging more um, self builds and I think that's a direction the government will sort of be heading in, in if you look at the draft national planning policy framework. So we can we think it's a good idea and we'll certainly take that forward and we'll look at that as part of the master planning process that I've uh, just described. Absolutely. OK, great. Another question about um, heating networks and how we manage things like waste. Will you be considering those? Yes, all, all critical um, issues again. Um, we will look at, um, again, the master planning process is key to this. We'll look at all opportunities to deliver clean energy of uh, any source, really. And uh, that has to be uh, practicable and viable, but we'll certainly look at that. Also, in accordance with um, adopted planning policy, um, the master plan will make it clear that any subsequent planning applications will need to be accompanied by uh, a full waste audit detailing the sustainable management of all waste products. OK, that's great. Um, blue and green infrastructure, it's a term that's been banded around. Um, would you want to um, just give an, uh, some elaboration as to what is meant by that? Yeah, it, it's a buzzword really. It, it refers to water in the natural environment, so the blue being the water, the green being the natural environment. I mean, one of the benefits, I think, of master planning is we can plan to ensure that water features such as canals, for example, and, and that the landscaping form a central part, of, you know, the exoskeleton of that future development, providing important, you know, ecological, but also recreational and aesthetic contributions to placemaking. So they are absolutely critical. Thanks, Dave. As I said, planning is a, a profession that has a lot of buzzwords and <laughs> it does, yes. useful occasionally to step back and actually try and, you know, explain what they what they what they are. Yes. Um, one I've got in terms of time, we're, 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 we're running to the end of our time on this uh, particular section. Um, but I've got maybe one more question uh, I can ask. Um, can anything realistically be built in zone four, um, especially uh, with the ben ben Bremhill neighbourhood plan? I think it's a good question. And, and, and again, you know, I don't want to um, keep 
um, sound like a broken record, but the master planning is exactly to determine what can uh, go where. So the master plan will explore all the areas. It will set out where development is and isn't acceptable. And those decisions will be based on considering constraints, evidence from assessments, on the ground assessments, from consultations of what we hear from events like this, analysis, and also analysis of existing plans and strategies. The content of any neighbourhood plan would be a material consideration in that process. So um, it remains to be seen um, and that that will be part of the master planning process, which I said will be uh, consulted on in due course. Great. OK, um, thank you very much for that, Dave. Um, and we're still working to to time. We've got around um, 15 minutes left. Um, and what I'm going to do now is to um, essentially bringing questions that have come through the 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 uh, the, 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 the portal um, and questions that we've been asked that don't fall neatly within to within the within the four um, categories and so I'll, I'll be I'll be bringing in uh, colleagues to inviting colleagues to 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 answer these as appropriate to the question um, the first one I've um, I've got um, which came in via email is um, please can the council share its housing infrastructure plan which determines what type of housing i.e. number of bedrooms and what quantities are required to meet the current demand of housing in and around the town so I think that's one I'm going to put to you Dave if that's okay you're on mute sorry can you just repeat the question Richard yeah, it's um, please can the council share its housing infrastructure plan, um, which determines what type of housing, a number of bedrooms and in what quantities are required to meet the current demand of housing in and around the town. Yes, of course. Um, these these um, plans and the, the, the type and, and, and a requirement for housing is part of the local plan process. It's not part of this process, the future Chippenham one. Every um, every council by law has to carry out a strategic um, strategic housing assessment, land availability assessment, and also um, housing needs assessment, which shows the demand in the area for the type of dwellings, the size of dwellings, the number of bedrooms, etc. cetera. Um, that will be, um, that is published. It's on our website. I would recommend that anyone goes on to the Wiltshire Council website and looks at the planning policy pages. They'll find it there, and that will set out exactly what the uh, quantified and uh, evidence need is for this area. Thank you. Thanks very much, Dave. Um, the next question I've got is came came in by email. We've had several questions around around this, and it relates to the the council's own um, housing company. So it'll be one I will pose to si Simon. Um, and the question is: When will Wiltshire Council be open and upfront about the Stone Circle business it has set up to act as land agents and developers? Also, that they have already been funded with five million pounds from Wiltshire Council, and that the council state in their HIFBID documents that they had to borrow another hundred million pounds for Stone Circle business to progress this scheme. Simon, I think you probably want to respond to that. Yes, uh, thanks, Richard. Um, at the moment, there are no plans for Stone Circle Company's involvement if this development comes forward, despite the fact that there was some um, reference to that in the HIF bid. Mm. Uh, the council would have to consider any proposed business plans from Stone Circle Development Company against any other possible way in which um, the council's interests could be developed. Um, and would need to assure itself that the council is achieving best value for its interests and also issues around governance and risk. So at this point in time, no no plans for the use of Stone Circle. The, the reference has been made to um, the council's decision recently to fund Stone Circle Company in 21-22. So just to be clear what the process is, those companies are wholly owned by the council and under the shareholders agreement, the council agrees the business plan for the companies one year in advance. So the money and the business plan that the council has agreed is for 21-22. Clearly these proposals, if they do come forward, are significantly in the future and any proposals from the development company would have to be considered in line with those timescales. Great, thank you very much for that Simon. Um, we've had quite a few questions come in around um, the consultation uh, approach. Um, and 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 what one one of which is is I, I shall I think pose to you Simon um, is why does your consultation document not require personal details and signature? 
Yes, thanks, Richard. I mean, the consultation, we, we um, set out a strategy for consultation that was agreed by the council's cabinet. And the, the consultation that we're embarking on at the moment is totally in line with that approved strategy and also takes into account any obligations we might have under data protection rules. So on that basis, we haven't included the requirement for personal details and signatures part of this consultation. Great, thank you. Thank you for that. Um, we've had questions ar around um, how people who who don't have such easy access to the to the internet um, to um, keep up with this consultation, and I, I think it's important to say, as you said, we had a, a consultation strategy that we've that we've agreed, on, and it is difficult in these times where we can't reach out in the same way as we had been able to previously um, to to uh, uh, communities um, that we have to have a, a, an approach that's um, uh, you know as far as possible reaches out to 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 everyone. And um, we've made very clear uh, uh, in the presentation at the beginning um, that we do have uh, the ability to provide hard copies of consultation materials um, to those who don't have access to uh, digital uh, um, uh, machinery um, and paper copies can be uh, collected from the reception uh, desk at the council's Mon Moncton Park office and obviously as the um, consultation responses are received, um, we're also going to be making those available in, in the same way. But uh, we will be providing um, uh, you know, written responses to all the questions that, that have come in and be, be clear as to what the um, how, how these issues are going to be um, be dealt with. Um, further questions that have come in whilst we've been um, presenting. Um, question from the from the chat box um, which is how, how close to the Wiltshire and Berkshire Canal will the housing development be? Um, I'm going to hesitate I would probably put that one initially to 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 Dave if you've got a an answer for that Dave response to that. Yeah um, Richard as you know as I said about it's about master planning um, and the location of the housing or any employment land will be determined through the master planning process. Uh, and then subsequently individual planning uh, applications themselves. I think the setting of the canal, um, we would acknowledge its heritage importance, but also its ecological value and its recreational value and its place shaping. So I think it'd be a key consideration. We'd want to give it a really, really nice setting and make it a really attractive part of any development going forward. So that'll be part of the master planning, which uh, again, we'll be consulting on in due course later this summer, hopefully. Great, thanks Dave. And. Um, Another question that's coming through the webinar chat box. Um, it's not clear if there's real need for the additional housing in Chippenham and therefore the road. Um, or is this a case that Wiltshire Council need to distribute their housing requirement and thus building a road will permit this to happen even if Chippenham does not actually require it? Um, another one for you, I think, Dave. Yeah, I did allude to this in a, in a previous answer. Um, housing need, you've got to be clear, housing need is assessed as part of the local plan process. It's a, a, a part of the statutory framework, planning framework in, um, nationally. Um, and that is currently, as I've said, separate of a, a subject of a separate consultation being undertaken by the council as a local planning authority. And we'd uh, really engage, you know, and urge you to engage with that process. The evidence um, is produced in a document that's known as a strategic housing needs assessment. And that's carried out regularly by councils as local planning authorities. So you can view it on our website. If you do get any trouble finding that, please contact the future Chippenham team and we'll email you a link if that helps. It, you know, it is there though. It should be quite easy to find. I'm going to say that the current, you know, I don't want to tread on local plans toes, uh, but the local, the local, the, 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 new, the latest housing needs does say that there's a significant need for new housing over 25 years and hence the local plan is looking at how best to accommodate that. And that's for that process, not for this discussion really. So um, yeah. I would just, you know, just say that people say, well, we're not a growing population. What, where does the need always come from for more housing? And I, I think it is important to recognise things like, you know, we have got increased life expectancy and people do occupy homes in, in smaller family units and that's where some of the driver for, for growth comes from. Okay, thank you Richard. Thank you Dave. Um, another question which I'm going to put to Jamie um, that's come in via the webinar chat box. Um, where is the example of a town which has had its cycle path ruined when we're all enjoying the outside areas more? A cycle path through a housing estate with only a courtyard between it. Currently we have a seven mile cycle route through valuable farmland. It's against the government's 10 point climate plan 
to destroy it? Challenging question, um, which I'm going to put to you, Jamie, if you would. Yeah. Uh, to give yeah. an initial, initial response. Uh, some, I think some quite strong assumptions, and obviously the, the particular person's concerned that uh, about what we're, what we're proposing. Uh, obviously, it's a very early stage. We're optioneering at the moment, but we, as, as part of the master planning, uh, we'll be looking at the existing public rights of way. We will we'll consider discussions for, with the National Cycle Network, the Canal and River Trust for the for the canal, and actually the the new networks for, for cycle and pedestrian routes won't just be alongside the roads. They will run through the development. Uh, they'll they'll seek to use an imp existing public rights of way, improve the infrastructure there, and improve connectivity. So actually, I think there's there's some really mm -hmm. great opportunities to to connect provide better connections down to the canal, additional crossings over the River Avon. Um, so I think there's some assumptions there and, and some statements there that, and obviously yeah. somebody's concerned, but I, actually I think it's a real opportunity to, to improve mm. the connectivity, improve and then and to improve the infrastructure. But the, the, the mechanism for doing that really is, will be consulted on as part of the master plan. Thank you, Jamie. That's important to, uh, um, you yeah. know, be clear that there are some uh, people are making assumptions at times and that we need to kind of you know challenge those and be, be clear there are there are some great opportunities here um so i've got another question that's coming through the through the uh through the web chat which i'm going to direct towards tom i think um does any of this thinking um take into account changing behaviors as a result of climate change efforts to get to zero carbon or the or the covid pandemic so um, yeah, so in respect of sort of the carbon, um, sort of going back to what I was saying earlier, um, carbon reduction is sort of a key part of the design pro progress going forward, both for the road and also for um, well, for the housing when that um, really starts to kick up. Um, I've already mentioned sort of opportunities and potential methods for the road around those avoidance, reduce, um, compensate sort of things, but obviously the master planning has similar um, opportunities in respect of you know planning for people more, you know, more electric cars and planning for the fact that more people can use um, active transport to get into the centres to uh, to get into the centres to the train station and maintaining you know, good bu bu public transport access is all, all those sorts of things and I think that's the I think that's a real key of this um, the whole design to come forward really is that um, it will be with that in mind it's all going to be sort of future proofed um, towards where 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 both um, Wiltshire Council but nationally we're trying to, to aim to achieve um, towards that sort of net net zero target. Great, thanks thanks for that, Tom. I think we've got time for one one more question, um, which again has come through the, the web chat, and I'm going to direct towards um, Steve Wilson, um, and it's around the the bridges. We we've talked about the length of the bridges, but we haven't talked about the height. Steve, how high are they likely to be? Oh, um, yeah, Jamie, obviously, I think it, when the presentation was going through, clearly gave an indication as to the length. These are actually going to be some fairly long bridges, some of the longest bridges in, in Wiltshire, um, viaducts effectively going across the, the floodplain. Uh, I suppose one when, when you say a long bridge, you, you think about a big sort of archway going over the River Severn, uh, cable stayed. I don't think we've got anything of that sort of scale or nature in mind. I think we will be seeking to follow the natural topography of the of the area of the land, keep the the scale in terms of the height and the visual impact as low as we can. So fairly low level in terms of height impact, really just following the uh, the natural lie of the land, Richard. Yeah, I can I can probably add a bit to that actually. So the, thanks, Jamie. The, the the concept designs that we've we've undertaken so far. So they they consider the uh, flood zone three and the, so it's the one in a hundred year flooding plus climate change they for the for the river uh, and then they add a an, an extra onto that uh, which is called freeboard so when when the uh, when the river is at the highest level for the one in a hundred year event uh, effectively driftwood and trees that float down don't don't uh, conflict with the underside of the bridge so there's actually a there is a, a design standard that, that you would apply and actually we've kind of already applied it, but that's that's the minimum level you would you would set it at, but it has to clear, has to clear the yeah. flood zone. So but sure, it does sure. sit, as Steve said, it does sit lower in the landscape uh, and as and as low as we can as long as we clear that that particular yeah. flood zone. 
Great, thanks, Jamie. Well, I'm afraid we've run out of time for the um, for the questions. Obviously, we have had further quite a lot of questions that have that have come in, and we will be providing a, a written um, response to to the questions that we've received uh, as part of this consultation. So, if we can move just to the next um, uh, wrap up slide. So, this is this is just to highlight the um, the next um, steps in in the process. So. The preferred route is going to be influenced by the consultation that we're undertaking now, discussions that we're having with landowners, engagement with suppliers to help inform cost um, implications, um, and an understanding of the environmental case using data from the field surveys, flood, flood modelling, um, scheme cost estimates. You know, there's a lot of work that we need to be doing, and we will be doing to uh, inform the uh, the ultimate um, route, uh, preferred route that will be. Uh, selecting for for this. We're expecting an announcement to be made um, later this year following an update uh, to the options assessment report um, and then it's going to be progressed um, to support a planning application for the distributor road. So um, thank you very much um, for your time and thank you for um, uh, joining us today and our presenters and panellists. Um, I do hope that you found this uh, interesting and helpful. As I said earlier, that a recording of this webinar is going to be available on the Council's YouTube channel shortly. Um, just a reminder that there's more information on how to respond to this consultation. It's available on the link, which is which is uh, shown for you there. Um, all consultation responses must be received by 5 p.m. on Friday, the 12th of March. Um, Obviously, we welcome all feedback, uh, both positive and negative, which is an essential part of any consultation process uh, and inform our decision on the selection of a preferred option. If you've got any further questions, please email the Future Chippenham uh, uh, team on that address there, futurechippenham at wiltshire.gov.uk. Um, thank you once again and um, enjoy the rest of your weekend. <laughs>